Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. Listeners, we are joined by an illustrious young guest who I will introduce momentarily. But first, I wanted to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com. Our guest is actually somehow, among his many other accomplishments, a Chessable author. His Chessable course, Youngest Grandmaster, Abhimanyu Mishra, takes you behind the scenes of his thought processes in some of the critical games that earned him the title. Uh, as our guest will be discussing, he also, especially as he got stronger, started to use chess those of you who heard my interview with Grandmaster Sam Shanklin will have heard him discuss, and Abimanyu has discussed how he relied on Sam's D4 repertoire when he was grinding to get the GM title. But of course, there's material there for players of all levels. And if you um, sign up for Chessable Pro, you can get a discount on all courses and help support Perpetual Chess. So as always, if you could use the link in the description, it helps out Perpetual Chess. As for our guest, I think all of you listening are quite familiar with this young man. He's just been setting amazing record after amazing record, most notably, of course, uh, he was the youngest grandmaster in the world uh, at the age of 12 years, four months, and 25 days. But even since then, he has been making astounding progress as a 14-year-old. He's already number 10 in the world for juniors. He's an outlier among outliers. There's no one under 17 in the top 10 aside from him. Um, somehow he's also an author. I really enjoyed his book, How I Became the Youngest Grandmaster in the World, which came out last year with New in Chess. It's kind of a blow-by-blow -blow account of all the work that goes into uh, these amazing feats. Um, and he's accumulated so many accolades, I can't list them all. But suffice to say, I'm really excited to welcome to the program Grandmaster Abhimanyu Mishra. Welcome, Abhi. Hi, Ben. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat with you. Uh, just incredible progress. Um, and the thing that strikes me, and this has struck me for a long time, as obviously a big fan of chess and someone who's sort of seen your, your story develop over the years, is your work ethic really stands out. And I'm a dad, Abby. I've got two kids, and I can't get them to do much of anything, you know? <laughs> um, but meanwhile, you're studying chess like many hours a day. You're also fulfilling academic requirements. So I'm curious, Abby, like, what motivates you? What is it about chess that gets you to put in such hard work to have achieved all that you have so far? Yeah, chess is an amazing game. It mirrors life in a lot of different ways. It mirrors math, decision making, analytical skills. It helps in a lot of different fields. And other than that, I have this desire to be the best in whatever I do. So that's another, another factor that encourages me to push forward. And are there days, I mean, Obviously, I also love chess, but nonetheless, as like an amateur, you know, decent player, there are days where I don't feel like doing it. Do you have days like that or are you just always raring to go? Well, yeah, of course, these days happen once in a while, but I always have some short term target. Like, for example, as of now, my short term target is to break 2700 ELO in another year or so. I want to be. Yeah, so you're hoping to be the youngest super GM in history, correct? Yes. So these these goals help me help me work throughout the day because okay, one one day means a lot in terms of chess progress. Yeah, and I'm sure, Abi, one thing that impresses me in reading your book is a lot of people from your generation um, aren't necessarily reading books as part of their chess regimen, but you seem to have a very wide range of chess interests. Yes, you read books. Obviously, you're working with an engine. You've got top coaches. But out of all these resources, Abhi, like, what do you do today to study chess now that you've reached the 26, 27 level, which is just astounding? Yeah, as of now, I use many different things to train. One of the main things I do while training is I like to look at top grandmaster games and I try to f try to improve. So usually there are top grandmaster games going on uh, classical. I like to look at classical games as they have the best quality of mistakes from top players. And the good thing with chess is it's, it's the good thing with chess is that it's such a vast game that no matter how strong you are, you, you still make mistakes. And I like to look through these mistakes and try to solve these positions myself. Try to compare them with what I was thinking and how how I can fix these top players' mistakes. So that in my own play I would be able to, to solve such situations in a better in a better manner. That's interesting. And what's your approach? Like, do you have the engine on when you're reviewing the games? How much time do you spend per game? I'm curious about the details. Usually my dad has a list of these of these games beforehand. Uh, he's checked them, he's engine checked them all. And there he, he gives me some positions which I set up on the board. And I, I spend like, let's say, 10, 15 minutes. Because realistically, you could also spend three hours. But 
You wouldn't be able to, in, the, in a practical game, you need to be able to mirror the circumstances. Spending three hours over the board and finding the actual best move is not going to be helpful in the long run. I like to spend 10, 15 minutes as it's very practical. Okay, so he selects positions for you. And are they, so one thing that comes up a lot when we talk chess improvement here on the podcast is if you only solve tactical puzzles, you're kind of like, you're you're kind of over-optimizing for one particular thing and you're not mirroring um, what an actual competitive game is like. Obviously, this is not something that you don't know. Um, so I'm curious, are is it all tactical puzzles or is it just random positions that he selects? It's just random positions where top players have messed up. Like okay. top players, okay, it doesn't necessarily have to be 2750 plus. It's like usually any any good tournament, let's say 2600 plus, 2650 plus. Just any position where they've messed up and engine thinks uh, one player could have done better. Okay. And from reading your book, I know that your dad is a chess enthusiast, and I was impressed with how his knowledge of the chess world obviously necessarily has expanded uh, as your uh, chess has skyrocketed. But uh, like, how strong a player is he, or is he just, resi- or is he just relying on like shifts in the engine eval to find the positions? Yeah, he mainly... He's like a like 1,300-rated player, uh, let's say, like in USCF terms. Uh, but yeah, yeah, he usually uses like engines to find to find these positions. Like, okay, and obviously you're putting in many hours a day. So of of the hours that you study chess, like what, how much of how big a component is the uh, process you just described, Abby? Maybe this is around twenty like, percent. Okay. A, so what else are you doing? Other than that, I I really go through all areas of the game. Like calculation is another big another big thing I do. I find some puzzles or the other. It's always useful to train because, okay, it'll help me see things faster and it'll help me see more complicated things. Other than that, I like to go through some end game, uh, polish my openings a bit and so on. Yeah, I was impressed in, in the book that you mentioned being a big fan of uh, Endgame Magic, a recurring series by Grandmaster Karsten Miller. Because my experience as someone who used to teach scholastic players is endgames often are not their favorite. Now, obviously, you're you're not your typical player, but I'm curious, is that, have you always loved all aspects of the game, or was there a period in your chess development where you preferred uh, certain certain parts of the game over others? Yeah, there's times where, where of, of course, you don't, necessarily love everything about the game of chess, but you have to understand that at some point you cannot avoid it. Like just because you can't go to your opponent and tell me, don't take me to this kind of end. Don't tell me, right. don't take me to an opposite color bishop ending because I haven't studied that. Right. Like one day or another, you're going to have that in a classical game and you're going to have to face difficulties on the board. So yeah, there was like, for example, in my, in the early period, early stages of my career, I used to be very opening oriented and this this meant that, okay, later on in the game, I was having issues like with middle game and end game. And of course, I needed, you can't really like shy away from these issues. You have to work on them more. That's the only way how to fix them. Yeah, I enjoyed the part in the book where you mentioned uh, one of your coaches, Grandmaster uh, Magesh, uh, really saying, okay, I'm going to be his end game teacher, you know. Um, and then you had uh, Grandmaster Aaron also shout out to the Kings and Queens Chess Academy in New Jersey, who helped you a lot uh, focusing on openings. Um, do you still have, I'm sure you're, you, you mentioned on the C squared pod that, you know, you may not be able to reveal all of your coaches at this point, but do you still have different coaches working with you on different aspects of the game? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. There are many different aspects and okay. I don't want to share too much other than that. Okay. W- would you mind sharing, like, how often are you meeting with coaches during the course of a week? Maybe around, uh, two, three classes usually like not with every coach, but yeah, like overall in a week, two, three classes. Okay, and that would be so so four hours or something in total, or sure, yeah. Okay, um, and so what is your? And I, I'm guessing having crossed the twenty six hundred level, your opening work is now pretty much engine and database driven. Yeah, yeah, of course. Nowadays, you cannot. The days have gone where you can analyze without an engine. You, of course, you have, there has to be some sort of a human touch that. Many times, engine will say some position is say better for white. But it, this kind of position will be very complicated and you have really no idea what's going on. I think one another big aspect of opening preparation is making it practical. That, for example, if your opponent plays a wrong move over the board, you have some some clarity of what is going on and you're able to punish them. Mm-mm. So you need to make sure you don't entirely rely on engine, but it's 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 a pretty good, pretty big component. 
Okay. So you're working on all aspects of the game every day, doing some game review of positions uh, selected from your dad. And I believe you said to uh, Fabiano and Cristiano on the C Squared Pod, you're you're still attending school. But if I understood it correctly, it's like asynchronous. Basically, it's like an online school. Is that right? Yeah, I attend an online online school. So are those classes live, or are they like you just have to make sure you do the work at some point? Uh, th- yeah, they're live classes. It's not too much, like. Okay. Maybe a couple hours a week, but like more, it's not like anything. Like it's it's also another parallel front, but it's, I most of my energy goes towards chess. Okay, and but you feel like you're you're able to keep up with the schoolwork without. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. I, compared to these rook endings, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's not uh not too hard. Um, and do you? Do you? Are there any aspect of like not being at a school that that you miss? Well, of course, there's that social element a little bit, but okay, it's not it's not too great, like not that not that big of an issue. I have friends online, anyways, so yeah, that makes sense. And I guess when you get out to tournaments, you get to to see a lot of your uh, your colleagues as well. Yes. Um, okay, and so I feel like there's still some hours in the day, uh, because I know you're working hard that we need to account for. So maybe you could. One thing I'm curious about is. Like, do you have a structured schedule for your chess each day? Or is it more like, you know, you're going to be working on chess and you'll kind of just switch things around in order to fill that chess time? Yeah, there's not anything structured. Uh, like, as of now, okay, I don't really have too much of a schedule, but it's it's more of what's... Uh, it's also t- very time-based. Like, if I have a tournament coming up in, say, like, two, three weeks, it'll be very different than, for example, when I ha- when I don't really have a tournament on the horizon. Like if I if I have a tournament on the in the in the in a in the near future, I'll, I will be studying opening and such such things much more. Okay, and like for example, right now we're recording on January fifth. Your next tournament, as far as I know, the Prague Masters in February. So probably you're not emphasizing that much yet. Yeah, I'm not emphasizing opening that much. I'm mainly trying to improve my quality of play. Okay, and one thing I've noticed about you, Abi. You, you've got a sort of retro approach to chess, A, in your book, um, your enthusiasm for books that I already mentioned, but I also don't see as much emphasis on like online speed chess as someone like Nihal Sarn uh, or Ali Reza Faruja even uh, might have showed in their teen years. Um, is that a conscious choice on your part? Yeah, it's one of the, one of the things that I don't really like playing online in general. Like the time controls are very short and the main thing for me is playing classical chess and it's where I like to think more in general. So yeah, these online online things I play once in a while for fun, but not not as I don't think they help me too much in terms of improving my strength. Okay. And obviously when you were coming up as traced in your book, um, you played a lot, uh, especially like, you know, you played whatever you could, um, in addition to a hardcore studying schedule, but now that you you don't want to play just any tournament. Um, you've got like a decent sized hiatus, as we just discussed right now. Like, does it feel odd to you to to not compete for six weeks straight or whatever it is? Yeah, it feels a bit odd. It's also like slightly like relieving a little bit in a sense that okay, there's not immediate immediate games every day. Mm-hmm. But yeah, a lot of training is going on, so it's not all the time is being taken up, anyways. Okay, and do you ever play training games? Yeah, I play some online and so on. These are like maybe a couple games a day, but okay, not not like hundreds, not hundreds of blitz games every day and so on. Okay. And are those, those are just sort of like you're entering the blitz pool or are you like arranging games with or playing your, your trainers or like who do you play? Well, yeah, usually it's like in some, some rent, some, some website, some pool, just whoever's okay. willing to come on. Decent, decent gotcha. Long. Yeah. And obviously I know that you, you don't want to say too much about what your accounts are. You've got to, got to, uh, workshop some openings, um, understandably. Um, so, so not much blitz, um, and now a very varied approach, but would you say that you have like core beliefs about what the best things to get better at, at chess are? Yeah. So this is like a process to get better or? Yeah, like, what do you think are the most important things? Like, what, I mean, A, that got you to where you are, but even just generally. Sure. I think this, 
This is, of course, a very difficult problem and it's, it varies from person to person. But I think the, the best approach would be to find your problem areas. This can be done, for example, by analyzing your games. A every game you play, analyzing that, finding where you went wrong, why you went wrong. Because one thing with chess is it's not luck-based. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything, every mistake you make has a reason and it's, it's, a, it's a skill issue in some form or the other. If, for example, you say, I messed up in time pressure, there's two problems with that. First of all, why did you get into time pressure? And secondly, even while being in time pressure, you should be able to see these things. Like, there's, there's always room to improve, is my point. So finding where you're struggling the most and then working on that in a dedicated manner is one way to improve quickly. Okay. And then you're obviously, in order to do that, you're using a wide variety of tools as, as uh, all of us are these days. Um, and speaking of which, so we've got a question from a supporter of the pod. This is from uh, Brian Karen. Um, and he's also, Brian's a big chess fan and has noticed your, uh, if I may call it, like an analog sort of approach. Obviously, you're using digital tools too. Um, but Brian asks, he says, can GM Mishra share his insights on the comparative difficulties and advantages faced by prodigies over a century ago compared to the contemporary era? Specifically, uh, he'd like to hear you discuss where you believe the challenges were were both more formidable and more manageable, say, 100 years ago, or even if you just compare it to young Morphe, Capablanca, or Fisher. Um, I, know you, I know you know your chess history, so what do you think, Ami? Yeah, this is a great question. Of course, technology has played a, a huge role. It's one of the upsides of, of the modern modern era. That nowadays, everyone has access to a 3500 engine, and they can... All you have to do is just input a couple pieces and click enter and it'll give you it'll give you lines, it'll give you exact evaluation of the position, what should be done, and so on. If you think of like Fisher's era and like he had to if he like I think there were stories that he messed up a rook ending or something and he had he spent like months analyzing this rook ending and just becoming better at rook endings in general. Like this was this was frankly amazing for me. And another another key key difference is the access to information. Nowadays like all the information, like it's very simple to find, for example, opening courses and everything online. Everyone has so much more access to information. While back then, I think like the top inf the talk, the top books were in Russian. So Fisher learned Russian. Right. This shows how much dedication he had towards towards the game of chess, and it's the reason why he was Fisher. I love Fisher's worth ethic, and it's one of the things I try to mirror in my everyday life. Like, for example, once upon a time, uh, I lost this double bishop ending. This was around, like, let's say five years ago. I was like nine, eight, nine years old. And uh, I asked my dad to find some relevant material on this topic. And there was, of course, there was, nowadays with the internet, there's always, there's like unlimited amount of, uh, uh, unlimited amount of uh, information. So there, he found this game, I believe it was between Gongli versus Wang Hao. Uh, and it was, it was also very good because this game was annotated by Gongli himself, who played the game and won, and he was explaining his thoughts throughout the game. I spent, I put the, I put the game on the board, and I spent five, six hours, and I went through the whole game. And next time I got a double bishop ending, it made my life a lot simpler. Huh. I love that story. And is that typical for you? Because again, you do mention playing through a lot of games. Are you often putting it on the board or will you often just sit there with your feet up with a book um, or somewhere in between, you know, using a digital interface? Usually I put everything on the board. I'm quite old fashioned. Okay. And, uh, you know, that comes up, as, you know, I've the perpetual chess has a lot of adult learners who've sort of come to the conclusion that that might help with muscle memory. It might help you retain things better. Was that something that sort of was um, preached or suggested by your dad or a coach, or is that just a personal preference of yours? Well, it's kind of both, but yeah, from the very early days, I've been accustomed to the board rather, okay. than, rather than a machine. And yeah, most classical games are over the board. So maybe that has some kind of impact there too. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, you've got a, a shared love for chess books. Um, so even when you're reading books, like I think you mentioned, I think it was to Fabiano and Christian, you mentioned recently having read Think Like a Super GM. Um, when you go through a book like that, um, again, is that one, are you, is it always on the board, always old school, or do you, are you sometimes doing it differently? 
Yeah, like 99.9% of the times it's on the board. Okay. And as you reach the 2630 level, um, is it harder? Do you Are you reaching a point where it's harder to find books that can help you? Or are you still reading just as much as you use other tools? Yeah, books are always useful. There's always some some good book or the other by renowned grandmasters. Another good thing is that these books. Uh, one thing with me is that it's if one thing with me that is that if I if I get a book of say like hundred positions, even if ten pos- ten of those positions make me struggle, I'll consider it a good book. Okay. So uh, another reason why I pick up books from renowned grandmasters is that there are many different solutions. Like there's one solution to a problem, but there's many different angles of looking at it. And I like to see that even if I've solved the position, how these other grandmasters are looking and approaching the same the same problem. That that's a great attitude. Um, so what have been what have been some of your most formative books over the years, Abby? Yeah, I I think like Dvetsky's Endgame Manual was a pretty good book. I think like for the lower level, uh, Jeremy Silman had an Endgame book that was also quite quite useful growing up. Other than that. Uh, just trying to remember, there were a lot of a lot of different. Well, groups. before you go on, let me ask you about Dvoretsky's Endgame Manual because it comes up par- fairly frequently here on the pod. Um, you know, Hikaru, who I got to interview some years back, uh, mentioned that he thought it was indispensable for say twenty three hundred on up. Um, but a lot of trainers recommend it for lower rated players, and they might struggle with it. So, what level were you? Uh, be obviously again, caveat: you're not the typical chess student. But what level were you when you got your hands on that book? I started doing it like I think I started doing like the King Paul Endgame section when I was like seventeen hundred. But okay, I, I, from there I realized how complicated it was. I started actually finishing the rest of the book around let's say twenty three hundred, around twenty three, twenty four hundred. It was- okay, so that jibes with uh, Hakar's <laughs> recommendation. And did you go through it cover to cover, or like what was your approach to that particular book? Yeah, I went through every single position again, set up everything on the board, and it was the time of pandemic. So okay. So I had a lot more time on my hands and I was just making sure I did everything properly so that whenever whenever it opened up, I would never miss an I would never miss an endgame win. Amazing. And do you I I know you've used some chessable for your openings, but with a resource like that, with an with the endgame manual, like do you how do you make sure you actually remember? I mean, remember the stuff that you learn. I think one thing is like repetition might help over a long period of time. But I think this like one main aspect is that you're not supposed like well with me everything whatever I do I don't try I don't see the answer beforehand like I try to solve these positions from the book even though okay even though it's a theoretical position I for example let's say Vancouver I try to find the draw now okay. if I'm not able to find the draw okay that's fine but after after then reading the solution I'll understand the problem much better than I then opposed as to just seeing the solution in the first place so an emphasis on active learning. Yes. Yeah, the, that's, uh, again, commendable. It seems like you were getting good good advice from, from a young age. And um, do, you think, do you think that you have a particular skill that stands out? Like, of course, Magnus, Magnus is famous for having this, this amazing memory that his, his trainers highlighted from a very early age. Hakaru, it was his calculating and tactical prowess. Um, do you feel like there's one skill of yours that, that comes easiest to you, Abby? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I'm not, there are many different things I tried to be, I try to work on every, like all, all the aspects. Maybe one thing I'm decently good at is mapping patterns from different positions. Okay. For example, like if I see some open, if I see some structure during the game, I'll try to map it to some opening ideas in, in a different, different context. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I mean, and to me, one thing, just as an outside observer, your work ethic stands out even compared to the prodigies I I mentioned. Um, but it's interesting for me to hear that you work very hard, you put in a ton of hours at chess, but it does seem like from what you, from what you've said in our conversation, there is some freedom within it. It's not like two hours on tactics, two hours on end games. It's, it's like what piques your curiosity within a given day. Is that fair to say? Well, of course, there's always a mix of everything. Like I don't want to just be working on end games the whole day because right. after a period of time, it won't be too helpful. 
So yeah, there's a mix of everything, but it's okay, not too strict. Okay. And what's your approach with your games, Abby? Like, do you, I, you mentioned in the book, I believe, reviewing them without an engine, but I'm curious, like how much time you spend reviewing each game and how often you revisit your games? Usually, even in the middle of tournaments, like of, during the game, like these games are broadcasted online and so on. So while I'll be playing inside my game afterwards, by the time my game is over, no matter what the result is, my dad will have prepared an analysis of the whole game. Wow. And so whatever mistakes I made throughout the game, I will I will like set them up on the board and I will try them again. This is so that I can become better for the next day. Wow. That, that's... Usually, that's... It, Sorry, go ahead. It depends on the on the size of the game and how many mistakes I've made. But yeah, usually it takes maybe half an hour to one hour. Not too bad. Oh, that's not bad. And in the older days, like, um, is, was that typical, like, throughout the last few years of your chess development? Um, or was there a period where you were spending more or less time reviewing your games? But yeah, throughout my chess development, I've always been spending... I've been always putting emphasis on whatever mistakes I've already made because that's one of the best indicators of where you can improve. Okay. And then I'm guessing uh, some of your trainers are maybe reviewing your games as well? Yes. Yeah, they also okay. help with this decision, this process of finding out where the where the issues are. And do you find it a challenge? One thing I've noticed is it can be easy to say, like, you know, to drill down on a specific mistake you make in a game, but maybe not necessarily to notice a sort of broader pattern how, do you have any advice for how to notice like a pattern of something that needs to be worked on in your game? Yeah, this is also quite interesting. Uh, there's no like definite answer per se, but I think it's like maybe like you'd have to kind of you have to look at the game with fresh eyes and you'd have to kind of compare that. Okay, this game I met, this was the mistake. This was a mistake. What what is similar in this? What is different in this? How can I get is this common or is this completely different? Like, it's not it's not too simple. It's very simple to say this, but it's much harder to actually implement this. But I think, yeah, you have to kind of look at these games with fresh eyes and try to see. This is, this is also where it, it helps having a second person. Yeah. Like a, a trainer or a teacher, a coach, any, anyone can help with, with this process. Because, okay, they're not, they're, they're less biased in some sort of a way. Yeah, I was thinking about that and bias because in one of the, the interviews I saw with you, you mentioned, you highlighted the point that even when you win, you still made mistakes in the game and that it's important to learn from those mistakes, not just the games that you lost. But I feel like humans have trouble with that. If you win, you tend to put a sort, at least I tend to put a sort of like halo effect over the game. And if you lose, it's like you're a complete idiot. I'm a complete idiot. And, you know, everything I did was wrong. Do you do you struggle with that? And have you developed any sort of like systems, if so, to sort of counterbalance that? Well, one thing with another, another thing about chess is it's a very volatile game. Like a game can go for six hours. One person can be completely winning throughout and at the last minute, they mess up and it's a draw or they even lose the game. So this is why the result is not everything about the game. Like, the result doesn't talk, doesn't speak to the experiences during the game. Like, entirely. Right. So, yeah, it's like, I, I tried, okay, even if I win a game, it, that usually makes the, the analysis more more pleasant. But right. other than that, it's not not too important. The uh, analysis of your Ivanchuk game must have been uh, pretty pleasant. <laughs> well, yeah, but then it's like, it's so then you have to like, I had to flip the board. And another thing is, okay, if my opponents also made a mistake, what I was thinking throughout, uh, like during that moment, how, how to defend in their situation. That's another thing which I do if I have time. Oh, okay. And do you have a favorite game that you played? I think, yeah, that Ivanchuk game was quite good. Uh, that was a very, very attacking game. I sacked, sacked a piece in the opening and started started attacking through the central files. And that was a very nice miniature. Yeah. And for listeners, you can see Abhimanyu's postmortem analysis in a post-game interview. Uh, I'll link to that in the show description. Although, it was a lot of fun. Although there was another really great game I played against uh, Levon Rodian. Uh, it was a very... He, he's, of course, a, he was a legend. Like, he was... I think he was like top 10, top 15 when we played the game in US Championship. And it was a very, it was a very different approach. It was a very positional game. And I, I, uh, I squeezed him and that was a very, very, very good game. 
Yeah. Now, Abby, I know you've had so many landmark successes that like from the outside looking in, it, it to me, it seems like it might be even hard to process, you know, but something like beating a legend like Aronian, like, do you ever just step back and think like, you know, I was reading, I was reading this guy's, you know, following his games three years ago. And now not only are you sitting across from him, but, but beating him, like, it's amazing. Yeah, definitely. I've, <laughs> I've grown up looking at his games, uh, learning from from his from his annotations on games and so on it's like it's it's a dream come true basically and you know you're so young i i mean i can't when i was 14 trust me i was not being erroneous like do you have any do you have to sort of like try to clamp down an urge to sort of get too excited that you did something well because there's more that you want to do like i'm curious how you balance all the amazing things that you've done Whereas you still have a goal, like to be the first, you know, twenty-seven to be the youngest twenty-seven hundred player that that has to keep you working. Like, how do you balance those things? Of course, it was very nice on that day, but I. But as the tournament went on, okay, I realized that just because you won that game, it doesn't mean that all the future problems are also solved. You will, you will still have to face these problems. You, this goal still remains. You haven't finished. You. This is basically. This is like a milestone. It's not like chess. Chess improvement in general is a marathon. And okay, I've re- realized okay, like winning one game doesn't doesn't fix everything. Yeah, amazing perspective for such a young man. Um, so I saw on your Twitter feed back in November. Um, you mentioned on C squared. It's uh, your, your family runs your social media accounts. Um, uh, a picture of you chatting with Anish Giri. And I'm just curious, like players like that who've been, you know, been through the ringer, they've been top young players and now they're top players in the world. Is, is there any um, like particularly memorable advice you've gotten from anyone? The best chess advice? Well, it's not essentially, it's not advice. It's like a fact that I've learned like throughout the years is that, okay, everything, every mistake you make in chess is is skill related. It's not. It's not due to some external factors. Like, okay, outside it was raining, so I messed. I messed this up. It's, <laughs> there, there, there's a reason behind everything. That's interesting. Uh, so, yeah, taking responsibility for for your results, um, definitely, uh, <laughs> definitely a, um, a good lesson to take heart, even if it's painful after uh, some losses. Um, and you mentioned another thing you mentioned in the book is that you were into martial arts and soccer. Obviously, at the top level, it seems like fitness has become a bigger um, point of emphasis for players like Magnus and Fabiano. Um, I'm curious, are you still into martial arts and, and soccer, Abby? Unfortunately, no. Nowadays, it's like full full chess in school. Oh, wow. Um, that makes me worry. So do you, So my kids, I mean, they're younger than you, but like days where they can't go outside for uh, recess because it rains, there's like this pent up energy. They're just absolute <laughs> lunatics. Um, do you ever feel that way from doing chess all day? Well, of course I go outside. It's not like I just <laughs> stay confined within this, t- this tiny room, but yeah, it's not, not too much. Okay. And do you think that stuff like that matters for stamina? Um, or do you feel like you're young enough where you can play a long game no matter what? It matters in the long in the long run. Like, I mean, one thing I'm doing to help this is like I go outside for a walk every day, just for a while. Just, just don't do anything. It's it's also just a nice release. You don't have to think about anything. Just walk for a bit and then come back come back inside. It helps with stamina. But yeah, this is another stamina is a very crucial aspect of one of one's play. Okay. And when you go for a walk, because you hear people like Gelfand always talks about how he likes to go for walks before his games. Even back in the day, Josh Waitzkin used to write about his pregame walks. Um, I'm curious, though, in the uh, information age, because like when I go for a walk, it's like I try not to, but I'll be staring at my phone the whole time or listening to a podcast. Obviously, that's kind of on brand for me. Um, But I'm curious with you, like when you go for a walk, are you really able to like sort of unplug or are you still like checking some chess on your phone as you walk? Yeah, usually I just I don't take a phone. I just walk outside. I just immerse myself in nature for this period of time. Good for you. That that's admirable. Now, 
Abby, on a on a separate topic, um, I was reviewing your social media feed, um, and you'd put your pin tweet as an interview with uh, Sabina Foyser uh, at the St. Louis Chess Club, where you're relishing in your amazing performance at last year's U.S. Chess Championship, uh, as you should have been. But she also asked you about uh, sponsorship. Obviously, it's not cheap. You've got multiple trainers traveling all over the world. Um, do you have anyone helping defray costs outside of your family? Unfortunately not. Like, I don't understand what more is needed. Like, there's people, like, chess players from smaller countries are getting 10 times more the support than I am. Like, I broke all the national and international records. I I think it might have something to do with how chess is viewed in the U.S. Like, we as a nation think, we don't really think of chess as a sport. Like, in my experience, I've noticed that chess is used as a tool to get into Ivy League colleges. So people, they're not really willing to go to the top level and so on. So what happens is that here, like one example of this is I had this, uh, at the age of seven, I broke this national expert record. And during this time, I like my parents, they applied to n- numerous scholarships, no matter the, no matter the thing, no matter the cost, let's say like even like two, $300 scholarships. And everywhere I was getting rejected. It was, and when we inquired, like, why, why? this was happening, we were being told that they gave it to a, a player who was rated hundreds of points below me, but he was heading off into college. So they're giving it, they're giving it uh, more emphasis to him. Yeah, that's, that's got to be frustrating for sure. And that even now that you're the age you described, it's, it's, you're still not seeing those opportunities. And yeah, and they're telling us to apply after 10 years. <laughs> right. Um, and do you know, I mean, this might be more for your dad to answer, but so does he try to reach out to sort of corporations or, you know, uh, people who've supported chess in the past? Yeah, he's tried many different things, but unfortunately I've seen that even after, like there are countries where players, they became, I am at the age of like 15, 16 and everyone, it like, it makes headlines and everyone is so proud of this player and so on. But here in the U.S., like, for example, after breaking this 20-year-old world record, like, the state, the federal government, of course, is, like, the federal government wasn't doing, wasn't doing anything. And, okay, even the state government, they, they reached out to us a little bit, but when we asked for support and so on, they kind of, despite, like, months of follow-up, they didn't really give anything. But yeah, it's super frustrating. And like, as we record this, uh, news just came out today that Prague got another sponsor, you know, like um, additional funding from from a billionaire and his his company. Um, yeah. And, and part of it, I think, just from my perspective, there's an infrastructure already in place in India that makes it easier, I guess. But it's, it's no excuse. Um, I, another thing I wanted to say, since you're here, um, is just the way your your breaking of the youngest GM record was reported uh, was extremely frustrating for me just as a as a chess fan. You know, I mean, you were attempting to compete during a pandemic um, and, you know, then you had like you wrote about Nepo's tweet um, basically saying that there should be more stringent requirements for when people get norms. And, you know, he didn't flag this in any of the, you know, prior attempts by other players to break it. Um, and then all of a sudden when it happened, he did, I, I'm, I'm sure did, did that cast a pall over the experience at all for you, Abby? Yeah, it was a bit, it was, it was frustrating for sure because like every hour, every article after that point referenced this, by the way, that world number two thinks that this, this was not broken in, in a very, this is not like, in, like it kind of took away from my achievement a little bit. Yeah. And that was the only way to attempt to get titles basically yeah, at, the at thing that was, point at that point okay everything was closed and i mean my only option the only place in the world where tournaments were happening was hungary so i went there yeah. i played 70 70 games in 77 days and i got the job done yeah and the book again well worth reading they they chronicle um in the book uh how like you and your dad just booked a one-way flight <laughs> like we're gonna stay here however long it takes uh until we get this title and as someone who's recently written a book abby i was really impressed with the quality of the writing the coverage of sort of your whole chronology um up to the point of earning that title and i couldn't believe it because again you're i mean you're 14 now you were like 12 then so i was curious did you 
did you write this? Or did your dad write it? Did you tell him and he wrote it? Like, how did that? I mean, I'm, I'm impressed no matter who wrote it, but I'm just curious what the what the process was like. Sure. So the main thing was that I I kind of wrote it. I but of course the words and, and so on they were refined by editors. Like they weren't right. Like the vocabulary of a twelve year old is not not enough for a book in general. Right. I, even, I don't know. For you, it might be enough. Well, you I, as a 12-year-old, I'm guessing it might be enough. But Well, it's different because, okay, my vocabulary isn't, like, I'm mainly focused on chess, so I have, like, ch- I know a lot of chess words and so on, but, like, beyond <laughs> beyond words that are used in chess books, I don't know too much. Okay. I would say. You mentioned uh, Fisher, of course, legendarily having learned at least passing knowledge of Russian in order to read Russian books. I'm guessing these days, being that you're a native English speaker, you, you don't have to learn it. You don't have to pick up any other languages for your chess yeah another another thing is okay there's like translators online like the world is a much it's it's a much simpler era for information um yeah um so an- another thing i wanted to ask you about so i know you have the prog masters coming up i saw that you're signed shout out to new jersey with the uh, pro chess league I, is that correct you're going to be playing pro chess league this year yes and do you know when that starts i think uh this might I'm not entirely sure about the dates. I think it, it might have been around around the 30th. Okay. Hopefully. Okay, so coming soon. Do you have anything on your calendar uh past to the Prague Masters in February? As of now, no. I've been I've been requesting publicly for like for uh, tournament invitations and hopefully I'll get something. I believe if I get enough tournament invitations this year, I'll be able to cross 2700. Okay. Yeah. I I mean Sky's the limit as far as I can tell. And I was disappointed as a chess fan uh, not to see you in uh, in, in Say, which will be underway by the time people hear this. Um, so I'm guessing that, that there, was, there was no opportunity presented to you there? Yeah, we, we reached out to the organizers, but unfortunately, uh, I wasn't considered. Uh, that's really disappointing. I played, there, sh- I played there in 2023, though. It was, it was great. It was a great event. It was it was a nice experience sitting in the same room as Carlson, Dingler, and and all these other top players. Yeah, I mean it's an iconic tournament with so much history. So hopefully, uh, I would love to see you. I mean, I would have loved to see you this year, but barring that, I would love to see you, uh, 2025 and uh, many years, many years beyond that. Um, so, do you guys consider? playing in sort of these American weekend Swisses? I mean, some of them are pretty strong. Um, or are you mainly focused on invitationals at this point? I'm mainly focused on playing invitationals. Uh, the reason for this is I if I if I played the... It's, it started from uh, when, I, when I was becoming the youngest international master in the world. I've always wanted to play higher. The reason for this was it's, it's a choice. From that period... There are basically two ways you could have become international masters. Either you could play Grandmaster Norm events and get your norms from there, or you could play international master norm events and get your norms from there. I chose to play Grandmaster Norm events. The reason for this was that in later years, the competition wouldn't change so much. The competition would kind of remain the same. For example, like I think Norm uh, in Grandmaster Norm, it, Grandmaster Norm invitations would be like, say, 4.5, and then Grandmaster Norm would be like 6.57. So I would kind of be accustomed to, the, accustomed to the field already. And this is kind of what I'm planning to do as of now, to play higher higher invitational events so that I get accustomed to the top level. Okay, even if it means you have to play less frequently. Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, ideally, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have to choose. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious and feel free to, you know, skip this, but... Tata Steel, that's, that's an obvious one where, like, you circle it on your calendar and, you know, we wish you were invited. Are there other, like, specific tournaments that you're thinking about that, that would be nice to get into? Of course. Any, okay, any, this is not, okay, any specific tournament, but any any event which has, like, 2,600 pluses, that, that, that would be a pretty good event. Just any, like, strong event that invites good players. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. And and Abi, so you wrote in your book, you told the story of getting to go to Kasparov's foundation. You talk about your your being a big fan of uh, GM Maurice Ashley, and obviously you've gotten to meet him in St. Louis uh, subsequently. You, have you had any sort of pinch me moments in in your career so far? 
Yeah, I should mention the first time I met Kasparov. It was at the age of nine. Uh, there was this training camp in New York. It was amazing to see how full of energy he was and how how much passion he had through to the game of chess. He was still so passionate after all these years, after becoming world champion and so on. Like it was, it was amazing to see, honestly, for me. Like even nowadays, every six months we have a training session either in uh, New York or St. Louis. And I, I remember like one of the one of our past sessions. There was, I think it was in St. Louis. There was a TV in the left left hand corner, and there was some some study uh, on it, some like queen queen knight versus queen, and and Kasparov uh, looked at the study. Now you could tell for the next forty five minutes, even though we, we were going through games and so on, that he wasn't fully. <laughs> he he was he was still calculating the study, and he you could you could see the sense of relief after he finally solved it huh. like these these stories of how dedicated he is it's, it's truly amazing it's unmatchable yeah i guess that's how you get to be the goat do you have an opinion by the way about who the who the goat is yeah it's a very difficult question but i think magnus as of now is like one of the best players of all time have you gotten to chat with magnus at all i've i took a photo with him in white of 2023 but like talking to him too much, I not not yet. Okay, and bringing it back to Gary, like what were so you describe reviewing games uh, to the extent that you can reveal it? Like what what um, was the structure of those sessions? The structure of those sessions was that it's like an interview type interview type thing that we have to present six of our games from the past six months: two wins, two draws, two losses, and we explain our thoughts and what we thought like. We explain our thoughts during the game, and he would he would give us information on how to how to become a better player and so on. Okay, yeah, I think he's been using that formula for a while. How does it feel to sort of like sit with your games and decide which ones you're going to show to Kasparov? That's actually one of the <laughs> that's that's always a very very interesting experience. Like, okay, I, I remember even after winning like my game against Aroni, and I'm like, okay, I'm definitely going to show this game to Casper. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> but then you've got to show him some losses too. So what what direction do you go for those? Do you just show him like your biggest bonehead blunders or you try do you try to find the ones where like you played well while while you lost? I try to show games where I feel that I can learn. So like my biggest problem areas or or the games that were the closest. Okay. <clears throat> And do you feel like uh, you, you might not want to reveal this for competitive reasons, but do you feel like you have a relative weakness in your game right now that you're emphasizing? Well, as of now, not too much. Just okay. Like, okay, I'm just trying to improve generally, but okay, I don't think there's too much of a specific weakness. Okay. That that's that's good to hear. Um and when you do post mortems with like the you know top 10 players is there anything that stands out to you or is it just like they're a little better at everything? I think it's also for example when like uh when I was on C squared podcast with Fabiano it was it was amazing how even after like reaching 2800 how how he wants to understand the other person's point of view. Yeah. Like this open mindedness I think is one very very good aspect of these top players that everyone, no matter how strong they are, they they still look to improve. Yeah, it's it's a it's a great great attitude. And and hearing you mention Fabiano, I meant to ask you. So obviously, I, I really enjoyed your interview on C squared. But in, in discussing the sponsorship, Fabiano, of course, somewhat famously, his family relocated to Europe from New York in order to pursue chess more easily. Um, given the frustrating experience, and again, I echo those the frustrations that your your family is feeling as a, as a chess fan. Um, did you have any conversations with Fabiano about? Uh, and uh, you feel free again not to answer this. Did you? But did you or your family have any conversations about like, you know, how best to sort of continue to to make this path sustainable? Yeah, this is another interesting question. Uh... Not, not particularly too much. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, again, uh, hopefully these these uh, issues will resolve themselves with your continued, absolutely um, amazing success. Um, so I think Abby, we've covered most of the the major topics I wanted to 
to discuss. Um, we've gotten some recommendations for like us, you know, lowly club players. It sounds like your calendar is fairly TBD for the year. Your study regimen is um, somewhat free flowing, but hardcore. <laughs> is that a fair, fair assessment? Sure. And what about, dare I ask about like plans when you're 18? Do you, I mean, you're obviously on a professional track in terms of chess, <laughs> like goes without saying when you're, you know, the only sub 17 year old in, in the junior top 10 by th- three years younger than everyone else. But do you, do you envision a scenario where you might go to university or do you think it's uh, chess all the way? I think there's another important aspect that, in my opinion, I believe that I'm going to hit my peak in, let's say, two to three years. And by then, okay, then I'll, I would have decided whether I want to go full-time into chess or or I'm going to go into studies. The one thing I don't want is about the age of, say, 18, 20 years old that I look back and say, if, if only I'd done something a little bit different, life would be much better than it is right now. Yeah. But that's only, like, in life, we're all working with incomplete information, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you use that as a framework to make sure you work as hard as you can at chess. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, but I want to be able to do everything I can so that, okay, I don't reg- I don't regret it later. Okay. Um, and when you go, like, Prague is a beautiful, historic city. Have you been there yet? No, not yet. This is my first time going to Czech oh. Republic. Okay. And so you mentioned in your book you don't tend to do much sightseeing. Now that your schedule has sort of spread out a little bit like are you going to build in any extra time in in a trip like that well it's a quite exhausting trip i'm not too not too certain but yeah maybe maybe a little bit maybe last day i'll check out some some sites and so on but not not too much usually yeah and of course as as you guys mentioned in the book like your dad is is working for the most part like you often basically working two jobs as like your manager and caretaker and, you know, needing to actually do um, his, is he a computer programmer or software manager? What's his exact? Um, yeah, he's a software engineer. Okay, yeah. I mean, like doing that during your games and then being there for you when, when or doing it overnight. I mean, it's um, supreme sacrifice from your family as well. Um, so, Abi, you mentioned in um in your book, like you mentioned seeing this movie when you were five, uh, Run, Milka, Run. Um, could you could you tell the story of how that sort of framed your, your approach in your younger years? That, mil- that movie was about a very inspirational, it was a very inspirational tale about a, a real life story about how uh, Milka Singh, he, he was an Indian runner and it was how he trained and so on. Like it, they made a whole movie about his life story, and that that really inspired me to to push uh, and achieve my dreams. And are you able to? Do you watch any shows or movies these days? I watch a little bit, but okay, not like not too seriously. Just but once in a while. What would you watch? Not okay, not anything chess related for sure. <laughs> just just like I don't watch. I mean, other than I, the one thing I like watching in terms of chess is like the seats where podcast of course yeah like by it's run by fabiano and christian and they've done amazing they've done an amazing job inviting guests and so on like i've what i most like about the show is it's not rather than like specific positions they talk about a variety of things surrounding chess and i it's 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 amazing for me to get these top players opinions on on things like their thought process in general yeah i agree it's amazing and yeah they're and they're they're quite frank in it, which I really appreciate. I mean, they don't they don't hold back, and it's you know, uh, Christian does an amazing job hosting, and obviously, um, you don't get to hear someone like Fabiano like often. Someone like that would would not share their full perspective, but he's uh, he's pretty forthcoming. Um, but outside of the chess realm, Abby, like, can you reveal any of the shows that you're that you're watching when you do get a chance? Sure, I'm watching like some some random stuff on Netflix. Okay. Maybe a movie or two, some Hindi, some Indian movies and so on. Okay. okay it's not, not too, not, no, no, like particular favorite. No, not really. Okay. And what about reading? Do you do any non chess, like leisure reading? Well, if it's required for school, that's a different thing, but <laughs> usually <laughs> not, not too much. Okay. Excellent. All right. Well, Abby, it's I'm, again, 
just so impressed, obviously impressed with your chest, but also just like your comportment as a young man. It's, um, you know, proud to be a fellow New Jerseyan. Um, so um, congratulations on your success so far and uh, wish you uh, continued success in the future. Um, while I have you here, is, is there anything else, any other points you'd like to highlight? Sure. I'd like to thank everyone for the love and support throughout this journey. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and I'll link to all your, your social medias that so people can follow your continued progress. So good luck in Prague and the Pro Chess League, and hopefully you will have many other invites um, subsequent to that, um, certainly deserved. And uh, yeah, can't wait to see uh, your continued progress, Avi. Thank you.